want to apply the work energy theorem to three changes in energy. Okay, so now let's look at A. A says that we have a car that accelerates from 10 to 28.6 meters per second. We want to determine the work done by the car. So in A, we want to determine the work done on the car. What was the work done on the car? So let's look at this thing here. So here's what I find. I have a car. And what do we know? The car has a speed of V1, and we say it's 10 meters per second. Now, the car is going to speed up. So now the car has sped up and it's now moving at V2, which is now 28.6 meters per second. So the question that has to be asked is that what caused the car to speed up? In other words, why did a change in kinetic energy occur? So if I look at the car, the only reason, if I isolate the car, there must be an external force doing work on the car. And the question that I'm asking is that, what caused the car to speed up? And the way we look at it is that we have to look at the tire. Note that the tire, is in contact with the ground. So when I'm looking at the tire here, what am I actually seeing here? Well, for starters here, so when I'm looking at this tire here, I know that the tire is doing what? It's rotating in this direction. So then the tire the force of the tire pushes backwards. So what's the force that pushes it forward? According to Newton's law, Newton's third law, it has to be the force of the road, which we call friction. So friction does work to speed up this car. So how does it do it? Well, we start off with a certain amount of kinetic energy. Okay, we have this amount of kinetic energy right here. Then there's work done by the car, by the by the, the friction. This is the external work here. And as a consequence, the kinetic energy has increased to K2. So, what caused this change in kinetic energy? It's this work. So, from the work energy theorem, we could then say 
that the work of friction, as we see from our picture here, must be the change in kinetic energy, which then means I can then write as one half m2 squared minus one half m v1 squared. And since we know what the mass and the velocities are, I could then isolate the mass from the velocities, and then I have two velocities. One is 28.6 meters per second squared. Let me do this. Let me put the square where it should be. Minus 10 squared, and then I get meters squared per second squared. And then the value that I end up numerically getting was 398,000 joules. So therefore, this is the work of friction. So let's go to the next one here. So the next one that we wanna look at is um, read something like this. So now we're focused on B. So it turns out, it says that the lowest point in California is actually Death Valley. And you could see here is that it's at negative 282 feet below sea level. And the summit of nearby Mount Whitney is the highest point in California. Actually, that's, that's wrong. That statement is wrong. Whitney portal is at 8360 feet. It's not the, um, it's not the, so this is Whitney portal. Ah, uh, that's a mistake because, uh, Whitney is some, it's a 14,000 foot um, elevation change. So what is the change in gravitational potential energy of the most energetic 65 kilogram hiker who makes it from the floor of Death Valley to the top of Mount Whitney? So by the way, like I said here in B, I sh you, should, you should look at this online this is known as the bad water ultra marathon, okay? And the bad water has a pretty, pretty interesting, um, you know, picture. Here's, here's the elevation picture for uh, the bad water marathon. And you could see here, is that this is where the race starts. Here's where it starts. And then you get up to here, and this is where it ends at uh, Whitney Portal. Now the race here, the bad water, the bad water race is 135 miles. But what you're finding here is that, remember, that if you were to look at how high does it actually climb here, so 100, I should be a little bit more careful. So 135 miles is, is the horizontal distance. but you actually only climb 2.8 miles. So 2.8 miles is the vertical distance that you actually go. So when you're looking at this thing, what we're asking in this question here is that we're asking what is the gravitational potential change here? 
And the way we look at the gravitational potential change is that we imagine that we're looking at the force of gravity only here. And what we know here is gravity only works in the downward direction. So, so if I draw a free body diagram, of a runner, you could imagine that they have, they're, they're climbing, and so as they're climbing and they're running, you could imagine that this is the surface that they're running and it is angled, but if we're only focused on gravity, I mean, there is a normal, right? There's going to be a normal. And then I'm going to have two components of gravity, mgx, and then I'm going to get mgy. And of course, I need friction to get me to move forward. But if we're only talking about gravitational potential energy, then the picture changes. for the change in gravitational potential. The only picture we care is the vertical position. We start at minus 85 meters, and then to get to Whitney portal, we go to 4,420 meters. And then what we're seeing here is that this guy is now as far as gravity is concerned, is only running in the upward direction. So in other words, we are seeing only the force of gravity because we're only interested in what is gravity doing while our displacement is going to go in this direction. That's what we're interested in calculating. So if we do that, we then know that if we want to calculate how what the potential energy changes, we know that this has to be the negative of the work of gravity. But one way we can calculate how much work was done by gravity is by calculating the change in potential energy, which will then be mg times the height change. So in this case, the mass is 65 kilograms. And we can see here is that the height change is then going to be 440, 4420 minus minus 85. And this gives us 405, 4505 meters. So if I now punch these guys in, I'm going to get 65 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared times a height change of 405 meters. This then equals 2.87 times 10 to the 6 joules. And that would be the height change, the potential energy change, or the work done by gravity as you go up. Now, you know, just as a reference, this isn't very much. That's not a lot of joules, by the way. And the reason why it's not a lot of joules is just do a conversion. So if you were to convert this into calories, here's what you're going to find. That if I look at the gravitational change, it's 2.87 
times 10 to the 6 joules, and then this will be 4,200 joules into one food calorie. This says that it's 683 calories. That's not a lot of calories. It just says that this person probably spent 683 calories just going vertically, horizontally. You know, you, you got to be expecting that these guys, I mean, th this race takes around 25 hours, 30 hours. Those guys are probably burning 20,000 calories 